right, let me go ahead and say good evening to everyone. I hope you all had a thoroughly blessed day today. I did for sure. How many of you are happy to be here? Amen. Praise God. I'm very grateful for you coming on out, and I know that the Lord has a message for us. Um, last night, we talked about, you know, God repairing the broken heart, and we were able to understand the word heart. We did a little interpretation and then proper application, and we saw that a faithful application to that word heart is also the home. And so Jesus came to repair the broken home. And when we did this study last night, we noticed that there are three dynamics that makes up a home. It starts with the family, but then if you step back, it actually is couples. And then if you step back further, it's what? Individuals. And so last night, we talked about how God wants to repair the broken heart of the individual. And we saw that one of the best ways to do that is to address something that often we don't. And that is none other than childhood trauma. Unfortunately, we have experienced things, as Brother Calvin said, to a smaller or larger degree. We have experienced some things in our lives that caught us off guard and has impacted our minds and has caused us to be in a place that we are so affected that it begins to impact how we interact with people and even sometimes how we view God himself. And so that's the reason why we went into that. And remember, on Sabbath, we're going to have a question and answer session. I know that some of us are saying, well, where can I go? If I were to get counseling, where would I go? What would I do? What are the things to look for in a counselor? We will go over all those questions on Sabbath when we have our Q&A session. But nevertheless, we were able to see that there is someone who went through terrible experiences. Quite honestly, if, we're, if, we, if we can look at it carefully, we could even say worse experiences than what we have done. What's his name? His name is Jesus. And Jesus went through it all, but somehow he was able to keep his mental, emotional, and physical being intact. And this is why he qualifies to be our heavenly counselor and to be the chief counselor to help us through our trauma and to gain a solid ground. Tonight, we look at the couple. God wanting to repair the broken heart of couples. And so as we prepare our hearts for that, I'm going to go ahead and have a word of prayer. I'm going to go to my knees for that. And if you are able to, I'd like to invite you to kneel with me. If you can't kneel, just bow where you are. But let's all ask God to prepare our hearts to receive the message for this evening. Our loving Father, we are once again grateful to be here tonight. We thank you, Lord. It's such a privilege to come to church. It's such a blessing to be amongst brethren and be able to study your words and to hear heaven speak while we on the earth remain silent before thee. And Lord, this evening, once again, we are asking that you will please endow us with your Holy Spirit. Enlighten our minds and give us understanding and even wisdom that goes beyond our years. We pray that you would please forgive us of anything that we have said, done, or entertained in our thoughts that is unlike you. We pray for a new heart. We pray that you will help us to enter into the experience of what it really means to be born again. And Father, we are grateful that as we have this opportunity to talk one with another, may you minister to our hearts and open our eyes and help us behold wondrous things out of your law. For this is our prayer that we do ask in the worthy, the mighty, and the matchless name of Jesus. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. You know, tonight we are talking about the couple. And having been a director at a missionary training school in times past, working with lots and lots and lots and lots of missionaries, traveling all over this planet and meeting lots and lots and lots of God's people, if there's one thing that there seems to be a discontentment in is being single. And everybody wants to get into the world of couples, to get married. And the reality is, is that I perfectly understand why I have the privilege of having experienced both. I've been both single and now am married, so I know both worlds. And the reality is, is that while there's a discontentment in many of our hearts, uh, we need to check that. I would like to encourage you to look deep into your discontentment as to why is it that you are so tired of being single. You might discover some things that might even connect back to some of those traumas we talked about. But nevertheless, the Bible does give blessings in singleness as well. Now, I, I make this point in our study because there are some people who are single, not by choice, 
There are some people who are single as a result of having been married. And the list goes on. And I dare not make the singles. I remember I was invited to London and they asked me to do something for the singles. And it was such a blessing because in the Bible, what a lot of people don't know is in the Bible, there were actually many mighty warriors of God who were single and God used them beautifully and mightily. An example are some of these names right here. It was Paul, Daniel, Jeremiah, John the Baptist, Anna. They were single people. But yet these were individuals that God used in very mighty and marvelous ways. And sometimes we think, well, these people are the exception. Well, that's a lot of exceptions because there's even more single people than that in Scripture. But the reality is that God has a will that's always good, acceptable, and perfect. And in God's will, there are some times that he is going to have some of us remain single. Did you know that we have a quotation and inspiration in the book Child Guidance where God actually will have some individuals stay in the home? And they may not ever even leave the home. I'll be happy to show you that when we start talking about the children over the weekend. And the reality is that we need to understand that God has a will that is wide and that is broad. And the same way that I remember Brother Cobb on Sabbath, he was talking about how when Adam would, um, you know, name the animals, his mind was in tune with God. And as a result of that, when Adam named the animals, his mind was showing that he was connected to God and, and he was expressing the will of God when he said giraffe or hippopotamus or whatever the animal's name was. So it is with the Apostle Paul. When Paul was privileged to speak in 1 Corinthians 7, he was not speaking adverse to God's counsel, for God would never have allowed it in his word. Let me repeat that. Paul was not speaking adverse against God's counsel, for God would never allow that to be in his word. The Bible says... The Bible says that there's no variableness with God in James chapter 1. God does not contradict himself. God is not going to inspire a man's mind to say something that is against what God wanted. So if Paul was given the privilege to express that some of you should stay single like me, it's because God was in agreement with him. Are you following that? God was in agreement with him that there are some that the Lord will talk to and he will say for you, I prefer to have you as holy mine. There's a beautiful counsel in inspiration that says this. As in the days of Noah, I want you to read this carefully, family. As in the days of Noah, one of the signs of these times is a passion for injudicious and hasty marriages. Satan is in this. If Paul could remain single, uh-oh, watch this now, don't lose this. If Paul could remain single and recommend the same to others, that he and they might be holy the Lord's, why not those who would be holy his and wish to make a sure thing of avoiding the what? Cares, what else? Trials, and what else? Bitter anguish, stop right there. What, what, is, what, is, what is the testimony of Jesus explaining when he talks about cares, trials and bitter anguish the very common experience in marriage now again is God for marriage or against it oh he's for it but is God able to speak to the reality of often what takes place in a marriage yes so look again it says why this is the question recommending this, that they might be holy the Lord's why not those who would be holy his and wish to make a sure thing of avoiding the cares, trials, and bitter anguish so frequent in the experiences of those who choose the married life remain as he was. Sounds like the quote is encouraging us to be single. Now here's the question. Is this the opinion of a little old lady from the 1800s with a third grade education? Or is this the testimony of Jesus? It's the testimony of Jesus. The quote that continues, it says, and more, if he chose to remain so and could recommend it to others 18 centuries since, would not to remain as he was be a what? Commendable course for those who are waiting for the coming of the Son of Man. 
it would be a commendable course for those of us who are waiting for the coming of the Son of Man to remain as he was. Now again, I put this up here not to say that God is making a sweeping statement that we should all be single, but I'm here to debunk the sweeping statement that God wants everybody to be married. Are you following? I'm here to debunk that because I believe that that can do damage to the single mind. If we present that God's plan was always is and no room for bending or anything else, that God wants everybody to be married, that's his will, period. Then somebody says, so then am I out of his will because I'm single? Am I out of his will because I'm widowed and I choose to remain widowed? No, my brothers and sisters. God says, no, I have work for the singles as much as I have work for the married. And something that God says very different is he says, when you're single in the Lord, you're wholly his. W-H-O-L-L-Y, completely. When we're married, often we're not. We put children, we put husband, and we put wife before God. And what does it bring? Cares, trials, and sadly, many a times, bitter anguish. And so God says, hey, don't you come down on the single folks. God says, I have a plan for my single people as well. But somebody says, but Lord, I'm tired of being single. I want to finally have, be a couple. I want somebody special in my life. Did you know what God said next? Here's what he said next. Should you find the one? And I wish that we could be honest. I think we struggle as that as the people of God. We listen. When the Bible says that our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Boy, was God telling the truth. We are so selfish that we will convince our things that are not our minds of things that are not true. Somebody comes along. I'm doing marriage counseling right now. I'm doing marriage counseling with a couple right now. It's funny enough. Wow. I got to talk to them tonight. They're in California. So when I get when, when I'm done here, I get back to the house. I'm going to do my counseling session with them. And. I remember asking this precious couple this question. This question that I asked them was built off of the close of this quote. Here's what the close of this quote says. It says, unless evidences were what? Unquestionable. Not a single question remains. Listen, it says, were unquestionable that they were bettering their condition and making heaven more sure by so doing when so much is at stake why not be on the sure side every time again encouraging that single side the single side was considered to be the sure side but do you know that if you're considering marrying someone inspiration says you and I are to have no questions to remain of can they better my condition and how will they make heaven more sure for me? Did you know we were supposed to ask that? Forget all the handsome and pretty stuff. Forget all that. Now, again, I'm not here to say that you can go find the most unattractive person you can find. I'm not saying that. I'm a very balanced man by the grace of God. They need to be beautiful and handsome, at least in your eyes, because you're going to live with them. So you need to like what you see. So don't get me wrong. I'm not here to put aside the importance of attraction. That's not my issue. But the problem is we often put attraction way ahead of we put compatibility way ahead of this question do you better my condition there's a lot of people that i get along with but they may not better my condition there's a lot of people that i get along with but they don't make heaven more guaranteed for me god says when you get ready to marry somebody God says, if you are deciding to become a couple, you want to ask yourself, how does this person make heaven more sure for me? That's a very serious question. And watch out for the deceptive heart. Watch out for that lying heart that we all have. Oh, no. Oh, no. They make heaven better for me. We, we, we're quick to say, because the last thing we want to imagine is that we might have to say goodbye to somebody that we want to say hello to every morning. But God says, I want you to think about that because one thing is for sure, family, once you get married, once you say I do, you are stuck with that person, regardless of what revelation you get thereafter. And so God takes this thing very, very 
seriously. So again, I am here to affirm my single brothers and sisters that are in this church, and I'm here to affirm the single brothers and sisters who are watching through the internet. I want to let you know that there's a place for you. There are some of you that are single, and it may be God's plan for you to stay as such. And Philippians 4 and verse 11 says, Whatsoever state that I am in, I have learned therewith to be content. But there are some of us whom the Lord surely will allow and bless us to enter into marriage. And so there is that there are many of us under this roof right now who have entered into holy matrimony. There are some of us in this room that are preparing for holy matrimony. And the question is, is that if God is going to help us to enter into a marriage and become a heaven-born couple, then we need to understand what was the purpose of marriage from God's blueprint? When we look at the word of God, what was the purpose of marriage? Why, why did God bring it together? Because God's purpose should be our purpose. Amen? Amen? God's purpose should be our purpose. When we want to get married, it should be the same purpose of which God set it up for. The reason why there's so many marital problems is because people are getting married off of God's blueprint. They're not doing it for the reasons that God set it up for. So the more that our minds, again, referring back to our brother Adam, you know, it, when the mind is connected with God, we begin to do his will. As Thomas Jackson often says, if we are connected to that vine, then we involuntarily just produce the same fruit that comes from the vine. Our minds should be his mind. And so the first thing we're going to talk about is ideal. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a very, I'm a very idealistic man. I try to be. I try to be. I don't have a problem with reality. I have no problem with reality. I just lived most of my life in it. And I've realized that the abundant life is not the life that lives and swims and dwells in reality. Sometimes you got to set up some ideals that are way above the reality. And you got to shoot for those ideals. And watch out for that word better. Watch out for that word better. Sometimes we say things like, well, I'm doing better than most. We're doing better than them. We're doing better than those people over there. And I've learned that sometimes better becomes the greatest enemy to best. Better becomes the greatest enemy to best. We're so content in just being better than others that we never become the best that God has set for you and for me. And so by the grace of God, I said, Lord, I've made a decision. I made a decision a long time ago. How many of you have ever read this quote that says, all the promises that were given to Israel belong to us? How many of you ever read that? You ever read that? I read it. I read it many times. Are you the head and not the tail? Are you the lender and not the borrower? Those are, those are promises that God gave to Israel. You understand what I'm saying? Those are all promises that God gave to Israel. But the reality is, is that it's, it's, it's almost shocking how much God has promised to us, his people, and we are lacking in its experience. God laid before us the best. He said, here's the best. Here's the best for our children. Here's the best for our families. Here's the best for our marriages. Here's the best for our health. Here's the best God. I mean, he lays it out before us. But very few of us are experiencing best, probably because many of us are still stuck in just reality or just doing it a little better than others. And I decided, I said, I don't want mediocrity anymore. Again, if, if, if it's where I'm at, I'm content where I'm at. I get that. I'm good with that. I really know how to embrace reality. But I just don't like living in it. I believe that God's standards and God's principles in his word are way above the realities of what's taking place in our world, in our society, and even what's common in our church today. And so my hope and prayer is that you get to a place that you learn how to embrace reality while shooting for your ideal, shooting for the best, shooting for the highest of the standard. Now, when we talk about the purpose of marriage, God presents the best. He says, this is why I made it. So notice, the Bible says in Isaiah 54, 5 and 6, I want you to watch this. It's kind of like some typology, if you will. In Isaiah 54, 
the Bible says, for thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. So who's the husband? The Lord of hosts, thy maker. It says he is the husband and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. Interestingly enough, in the next verse, it says, for the Lord hath called thee as a what? As a woman. And then there's even more specificity because it says, called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth. When thou wast refused, saith thy God. So God likened himself to the husband and he looked as the people as the wife. That's what we see. Now that's from the Old Testament, but we also see it in the New Testament. In 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2, the Bible says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused or joined you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So Christ, again, is representative of that husband. The Bible continues in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Continuing, it says, verse 31 to 33, For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning what? Christ and the church. Okay? Christ and the church. In fact, I love this quote from Steps to Christ, page 10. It says, God has bound our hearts to him by unnumbered tokens in heaven and in earth. Through the things of nature and the deepest and tenderest earthly ties that human hearts can know, he has sought to reveal what? Himself to us. So in summary, the purpose of the marriage relation is to aid the husband and wife in knowing God and his relation to his people. Then they are to reflect this love one to another. This is the great, holy, and high purpose of marriage is in our marriage covenants we God says that husband was supposed to love that wife so wonderfully that wife was to reverence that husband so beautifully that the more that they did this one to another it was actually an educational tool the highest of true education it was an educational tool that we might learn more and be devoted more to God as we see he's devoted to us as his children as his people this is the great purpose of marriage. And in a few days, I'm so thankful. Uh, you know, I've been working a lot this year, a whole lot. And, uh, you know, working as a pastor, being leading out in the ministry, and uh, having a house that was loaded with renovations of all sorts, had to gut that thing and practically have it rebuilt all over again. That was a ton of drama. I'm ready for a vacation. <laughs> Seriously, I, I have never cherished a vacation. And when I leave here on Sunday morning, I land, behold my beloved bride, see my wonderful family, and then that Wednesday we take off and we're going away on vacation for two weeks. And I get to turn my cell phone into a Frisbee. You ever seen a cell phone turn into a Frisbee? You take your phone and you just, you know, you, you just toss it. You, you, you let that phone know, like you and me, we have nothing to do with each other for the next two weeks. And it's like, I'm serious, I'm putting all the right things in there, voicemail, like, hello, you reached Dwayne Lemon. You will get back in touch with me after two weeks. They're going to get all the emails, everything, and I'm going to get my time with my bride. And one of the things that I told Alexandra that I want to do is I wanted us to review the purpose of marriage. How am I fulfilling my role as the house band? How are you fulfilling your role as queen of the household? What can we be even more to each other after 25 precious years of marriage? What, what else can we be to each other? And this is something that I believe God wants all of us as couples to do, is to look at the ideal, recognize our reality, and see through the grace of Christ, how can we rise up to that ideal? How can we rise up to that ideal? I want my wife to know Jesus better and to love Jesus more as a result of how I loved her as a husband. My wife should want for me to love Christ more and to serve him more faithfully because I see how the church 
was to reverence God. This was the great purpose of marriage right from day one. And so what that means is that we have to also study marriage roles to a degree. And I want us to talk about that. Let's go to marriage roles. Let's go to Genesis 1. Let's open up our Bibles and let's look at the roles that God set up in marriage. Because this is a very important thing as we talk about the couple. What is it that God wants for the couple? Okay. And the Bible says in the book of Genesis, we're looking at chapter 1 and we're considering verse 28. Let's go ahead and let's see what the text says. And when you get there, just say amen. Right? Not all there yet. Genesis, we're going to chapter 1. We're going to consider Genesis 1 and verse 28. And let's go ahead and let's see what the Bible says. Are we all there? Amen. The Bible says in Genesis 1 and verse 28. Now, you remember yesterday we read Genesis 1, 26 and 27. We saw that God created man to reflect his image, to reflect his character. And we saw that he did this for both the male and the female. Okay? Both male and female were called and created to reflect the image and character of God. Now, in verse 28, it says, and God blessed who? Them. Don't lose that. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So, was it just one person or was it two people that were supposed to have dominion over the earth? It was two, the husband and the wife. Amen? All right. Now let's go ahead and consider Genesis 2. We're looking at verse 18. Now we go backwards to go forwards. God, God already made it clear what the role was between the husband and the wife, what they were supposed to do together in unity, which was to have dominion over the earth. All right? Now we're looking at Genesis 2 and verse 18. In Genesis 2 and verse 18, the Bible says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and what? Help meet, appropriate for him. So God brought a woman into the world to help the husband to be able to accomplish the things that he set them up to accomplish in life. And again, the woman was an equal. That's one of the reasons why she was made from the side and not from the head of the feet. Now watch this. Sadly, we arrive at Genesis 3. Now let's look at verses 4 to 6. In Genesis 3, verses 4 to 6, it says, And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Now she, she wanted to ascend to a higher state. She bought into the deception of Satan. Is that right? Now look at how God visits her sin because she was the instrument. Remember, she brought this to her husband and then here it is, they make this covenant with death and they both go into sin. Now, watch what God does in verse 16. In verse 16 now of Genesis 3, the Bible says, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire, your longing after, is how the Hebrew puts it, and thy desire, your longing after, shall be to your husband, and he shall do something. What is he going to do now? He's going to rule over her. Now he has dominion. The word rule literally means dominion. He has dominion over her. She wanted to ascend to the higher state. God says, all right, now I'm going to put you at a different state. Now I'm going to go ahead and let you now be subject to your husband. God was trying to teach some very powerful lessons through this. So again, summary, the husband is the heaven ordained leader of the home. That was God's plan now. God says, listen, the husband is going to be the leader of the home. The wife is to be subject to the husband's leadership. This is what God set up. Now, of course, women's lib and the rest, you know, we, we hate this, right? Um, again, depending on how this counsel has been perverted, even by godly men or men who profess godliness, this counsel is hated. This counsel is biblical and this counsel is beautiful and it actually shows even a story of the gospel. But today we live in a society where sometimes people fight against this and they fight against the idea 
that I'm not going to be subject to anybody. There's not going to be nobody that's head over me. Nobody's going to be the boss over me. Well, God says, listen, just hold on, because what we need to do is understand the husband's leadership, because I would like to suggest that there's a word that comes before leader as it relates to what God has raised up the men to be in the home, and that's called servant. Men have been raised up to be servant leaders in their homes. And it should be a fruit of his servant leadership that causes the wife to say, with gladness, I will be subject to the head of my home. And so by no stretch of the imagination are we here to push forward chauvinistic views of men dominating over women and all of this thing, all of these perversions that we see in our world today. God forbid, that's not coming from this desk right here. God is making it very, very clear that there was a judgment that had to come. And once upon a time where they were leading out in equality, God says, now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to set up the roles. And the husband's going to lead and I'm going to need the wife to become subject. And God says, and through this, I'm going to reveal the power and the beauty of the plan of salvation. So therefore, we have to talk about the husband, the most incredible, <laughs> the most incredible calling that could ever be given to a man is to be a husband, to be a house band. And there are three things in inspiration that God has called the husband to be. Three things. The head, the lawmaker, and the priest of his home. I'm talking to the couple. This is God's ideal for the couple. Is God says, for every couple that comes together, and when I say couple, I'm talking about married couple. When God brings these two together, God says to that husband, listen, I've called you to be the house band of your home. You bind everybody together in me. And in order to do that, every house band, every husband is called to be three things. Three things. The head, the lawmaker, and the priest. And the wife is not to get in the way of allowing him to exercise this very solemn and sacred God-given responsibility. Now, the beauty of all of this is that when we study the head, again, the head, the lawmaker, the priest, one of the things that I, I enjoyed in Bible study, I really enjoy Bible study. I enjoy studying the scripture. I enjoy looking at these things because husbands were supposed to love their wives as Christ loved the church. So the husband in Christ, thy maker, is, is where we see the connection. So what I did is I began to look and I said, is Jesus the same? And what I realized is all of these offices are reflections of Jesus Christ. All of them. Head, lawmaker, and priest. All of them are a reflection of Christ himself. So this is why it is imperative as a husband that we cannot shun our duty. Because when we shun our duty, we can misrepresent the ministry of Jesus Christ to our beloved family of whom God has given us the responsibility to bind together in him. And so it is that when we look at this, number one, let's talk about the head. The Bible makes it very, very clear. Speaking about Jesus, it says it like this in Ephesians 5, 25. It says, for the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church. But it went further than that. Speaking of the headship, giving more definitive action to the headship of Christ to the church, the Bible also said, and he is the savior of the body. So there's something about me being the head of my home that always looks at being the savior or the protector to the body. In other words, when we look at that term head, the headship of the husband consists in his ability and responsibility to care for his wife in the same way that Christ cares for the church. Part of my being the head, you know, part of my being the head is that I am going to demonstrate the greatest degree of care in my home over my wife. Protector, provider, to watch out over her, 
to make sure that my mental faculties are at such a place that if my wife is suffering mentally, emotionally, physically, or spiritually, that I can be an instrument in God's hands to help provide care for her so that she is well taken care of, to protect her. This is what all husbands were called to be as heads of their homes. Now, this is very different from what we normally think about head. When we think about head, we think about, you know, we think foot stomping like, look, you know, the, the, the leader of the home is here. And, and, and as you hear the vibrations of my feet, so it is you get the vibrations of my voice that when I command, you must do. And there are some people who treat headship in this type of manner. And yes, is there a place for authority in the home? No doubt. But the reality is, is that it is through the demonstration of care. It is through the demonstration of protection. It is through the demonstration of nurture is why that wife is so moved to subject herself under her husband's leadership because she's convinced he will not hurt me. She's convinced he will not hurt me. He will not hurt me emotionally. He will not hurt me mentally. He will not hurt me physically. He will not hurt me. He is my protector. Therefore, I have no problem yielding to his servant leadership in the home. Continuing, the Bible says in 1 Peter 3, likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them. I love that verse. Dwell with them. Dwell with them according to knowledge, giving what? Honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. You see, if you know you have a weak vessel in your house, you know what you do with a weak vessel? It's still a vessel. It's still something that's yours. But you know that it's weak. What do you do when you have something that's yours and you know that it's in your possession and you know you have responsibility over it, but you know that it is weak? You go all out to protect it. Is that right? You go all out to protect it. You do everything possible to make sure that that weak item does not go through undue and unnecessary damage. And so the Bible says, hey, husbands, dwell with your wives. Dwell with them according to knowledge. Give honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered I can which part oh again if you look up the Greek on the weaker vessel let's go ahead and let's take a look at it even now right if mm -hmm. when it talks about a weaker vessel first Peter 3 and verse 7 just to go ahead and entertain this very quickly in 1 Peter 3 and verse 7, we have this term of the weaker vessel. So when we go to it, weaker as a negative particle, strengthless, impotent, more feeble, without strength. This is what the word weaker means, without strength. Then, of course, you have the term vessel. When you look at the term vessel, implement, um, you know, especially as a wife contributing to the usefulness of husband, goods, stuff. You know, so in other words, what is the wife to be looked upon as or treated as? You see, the context of the verse is speaking to a loving care that the husband is giving to the wife. It went before in the verses talking about the wife towards the husband, Sarah towards her husband, Abraham, and her calling him Lord. She's demonstrating this reverence towards her husband. But now the Bible transitions from the wife and her function, and now it goes into the husband and his function. And it says, likewise, you husbands, you dwell with your wives according to knowledge, according to your understanding. And then it says, and give honor unto your wife. Because it just talked about how Sarah gave honor unto her husband, Abraham. It's a dual honor that's being given in the home. This one, however, it encourages the husband, give honor unto your wife as. It's not saying that the wife is some fragile, emotionally you know, distraught woman. What God is saying is, is that the honor that I want you to give unto your wife is the same honor that one would give unto a vessel that is weak, something that is without strength. You know what the Bible says about Jesus? When we were without strength, he came to deliver. Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. So if I see my wife that is without strength, functioning as a weaker vessel, I am coming there, therein as a savior to her, to protect, to nurture, to care, and to let her know that she is loved. 
to affirm her. This is what husbands were called to do. And sometimes we failed. And I'll be talking about failure because I stand before you as a man who failed. You know, I'm telling you, one of the most amazing things about God is he chooses imperfect people to give perfect messages. And it is a reality that some of us have failed. Some of us have erred. Some of us have not functioned as the husband we should have been. Some of us have not functioned as the wives we should have been. But I'm so thankful that when we committed those sins, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And so God wants us to understand that this was the role of the husband in his headship. The Bible says in Matthew 9, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. It was like Christ was looking at his wife, seeing them with no strength, seeing them like sheep with no shepherd. And here he is, the shepherd. And the Bible says he was moved with compassion. Did you know that that's what God called us to be? Not to be moved with irritation. Sometimes when we see our beloved brides in their weakness, in their challenges, in their being overwhelmed, we get irritated. Oh, woman, why can't you be strong like I am? Or we dare to even do the worst thing in the world, almost what we would call the cardinal sin. We say, why can't you be strong like that other sister? Brothers, please don't ever compare your wives to another woman. That is an invitation for demons and no angels. We have to understand that when we see them without strength, that is our opportunity to show up as heads and protectors and saviors to the body and to be moved with compassion and not irritation. And this is how God can help us. But in addition to that, we're also called to be lawmakers. God was a lawmaker too. The Bible says in Isaiah 33, 22, for the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. And then it says in Genesis 18 about Abraham. It says, for I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. God calls every house band, every husband. God has called us to be the lawmaker for our home, to set up the standards, to set up the rules to set up what ought to be followed even in his absence. And it needs to be practical enough that even though your wife is not built like you, she can still fulfill whatever that law is. When God gave his law, he gave it to people that through his power could keep it. When we establish law in our home, we need to make sure that it is practical enough that in our absence, our wives can still execute it. Don't give unrealistic laws. But set up rules, set up standards. And then when you are away from the home, that wife should be able to execute those standards because they're that reasonable and that practical. Christ is the lawmaker. God says, I've called you as husbands to be the lawmakers, to set those standards up and make sure that they are faithfully and righteously executed in the home. But not only that, we were called to be the priest of our home. We were called to be the priest of our home. The Bible says in Hebrews 5, for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Okay? This was the function of the priest. The priest would offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. That's what the priest did. As a priest in my home, we then begin to function like our brother Job. You remember Job? He, he, you know, and, and I love this part here in Hebrews 7, where it says, For wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. Is that an attitude that we adopt as husbands? Is I ever live to intercede on behalf of my wife in her strengths and in her weaknesses, in her perplexities and her sorrows, as well as in her joys? Am I one that ever lives to intercede on behalf of my beloved? That when my wife talks to me, I'm a man that likes to solve problems. A lot of guys are like that. It's kind of part of being the male factor, especially here in America. And sometimes my solving of a problem is coming up with ideas. And I'll say, okay, well, you know, all right, listen to that. Yeah, all right, so why don't you try this? And I think if we try this, we'll, it'll solve that problem. And so that's usually the problem-solving mentality that I have. But sometimes the Lord is reminding me, Dwayne, 
not everything is going to be solved through faithful explanation. Sometimes you got to be quiet and just pray with and pray for your wife. You know, sometimes you just got to do that. My wife has expressed things, perplexities of mine, and there are times that I'm like, honey, you don't have to look at it like that. Remember what the Bible says? And I'm, I'm just answering the question. And she's hearing it, but maybe there's some other problems going on in her mind that it's not registering fully yet. And I'm told in the book, Ministry of Healing, page 511, it says prayer and faith will do what no power on earth can accomplish. Prayer and faith will do what no power on earth can accomplish. Sometimes when my beloved bride begins to express her woes and her challenges, that is an opportunity for me to intercess on her behalf and say, honey, let's pray together. And we begin to pray about those situations. And what's beautiful is I'm teaching her that, hey, babe, even in my absence, Jesus is always present. In the same way that we just prayed and exercised faith in what God can do for us as I remind her of the promises and we pray about them, you can do that even when I'm not around. Jesus was the priest to his wife, the church. And he ever lived to intercede. That is something that we as husbands need to do more and still more and even more. The Bible says about our brother Job, as I mentioned earlier, and it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job how often? Continually. He was an intercessor. He was one that was always there. This, this is the ideal of what God set up for us as husbands. When we are married couples, this is what God says for us as husbands, that we are heads, we are lawmakers, and we are priests of our home. But of course, God has counsel for the queens of our home. The queen of the household, the wife. When I was doing my counseling with this married couple, again, I, or this, uh, this couple who's soon to be married, as I told the husband to read the chapter on the house band, I encouraged the wife to read the chapter in Adventist home on the queen of the household, okay? Because that's what every husband's going to be. Every, every single man who's getting ready to marry, he's about to become a house band. Every single woman that is about to get married is going to become the queen of her household. And so it is that God says, well, you want to read these things. You want to understand these things so we can know the role that God has called us to play in this beautiful ordinance called marriage. When we look at our sisters, the Bible gives a lot of beautiful counsel in Titus 2, 3 through 5. The Bible says the aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. We're talking about the queens now. All you queens in the house, all the queens that are through cyberspace over there through the Internet. It says that when you become a wife, it says in behavior as becoming holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine teachers of good things obviously not teachers of bad things it says that they may teach the young women to be what sober-minded and to do what else love their husbands i remember one time someone said there's nowhere in the bible where god tells the wife to love her husband uh, open book test the bible says that wives ought to love their husbands and they were to be taught by the older women that they were to be taught how to love. That means that, you see, when, you, when you're an older sister in the church, you are in a very privileged position. You are a very privileged position. You are truly anointed by God. You are called of God. Not only to be everything you are as an individual, but to be as much as possible to all the young women that come inside of the church. That's actually your role as the older sisters in the church. And the Bible says that we are to teach them to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good and obedient to their own husbands. Why? So that the word of God will never be blasphemed. You remember last night I told you about how in certain communities, um, you know, we have certain problems. And I talked about some things that can often happen in the black community. Obviously, I'm very familiar with it. And... Um, 
you know, again, like I told you, the same way that in, 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 in our communities, the way sometimes, and this is not all people in our communities, but it's often, it's, it's very frequent, very known. The same way that in certain communities you can see people, you know, beat their children and do all these things, and we laugh about it, we think it's funny, and it's not funny, it's wrong, and we ought not do these things. We learn them from many different sources. But the reality is, is that so it is sometimes even with some sisters. You know, I, I, I remember going through many experiences where I can talk to women, especially if it's a black woman. And sometimes as I talk with them and, you know, maybe you say something they don't like. Maybe there's something that was stated and all of a sudden their head <laughs> starts doing something. Their head starts moving, they, they start, let me tell you something, and their head starts doing this wobble move. And you know, again, and when I see that take place, that, that's an that's a indicator that some serious attitude is on its way. And all of a sudden, they begin to say things and, and shoot out things out of their mouth that sometimes they wish they could capture. And here it is that what inspiration is saying is that God says, listen, I want you to be discreet, be careful about what you allow that tongue to express and especially how you express it. And God says, and the reason why I want you to do all of this, ladies, he says, because I don't want God's word to be blasphemed. That people will begin to say, there goes the daughters of God. There goes the so-called children of God. Look at them. They're not discreet. They're indiscreet. They're the furthest thing from chase. They're bold and, and, and noisy and out there. And this is not what God wants. So God says, when you're that wife, you, you, you become like a model, as it were, especially to young women who are preparing to be wives. And God says, and I want you to be of such an example and such an impact that it will cause people to say, if this is what the word of God produces, oh Lord, help me to be a queen of my household. This is what God wanted for his daughters. Now, continuing with that, the Bible says in Ephesians 5, verse 24, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. You see, there's only two principles in inspiration as to why a wife would not or should not be subject to her husband. Be willing to, as, as the previous verse said, obedient unto her husband, following the counsels of which he has distributed for the home. The only two principles is if it is sin or if it violates her conscience. Those are the only two times you read an in inspiration where God makes it clear that the wife is not obligated to do what the husband is requesting. If it is outright sin or if it violates her conscience. It might be okay, but for her, it violates her conscience and she's not comfortable with it. Those are the two principles by which the wife can now step back and say, dear, I love you and so on and so forth, but I cannot do that. Is if it is sin and if it violates her conscience. If it is not sin and it does not violate your conscience, then God says, you must allow your husband to be the head. And you must be willing to obey, to subject yourself and to allow him to lead out on behalf of your home. The scripture says when we do this, we are exemplifying the very example of how the church is to be to Christ. Continuing in Colossians 3 and Acts 5, the Bible says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Don't submit to another husband, but submit unto your own husband as it is fit in the Lord. That term fit is proper or convenient. That's what it means, proper or convenient. And then it says, and remember, you ought to obey God rather than men. So again, you submit unto the husband, but you only do that as it relates to him giving godly counsel. When the husband calls the wife to do anything that is outside of the harmony with God's word, you ought to obey God rather than men. And this is edifying. I remember um, my wife, she, she knows me well enough now, uh, of course, been 25 years, been 27 years together, 25 years of marriage. And, you know, she knows the best way to shut me down. She knows the best way to shut me down. Like, she might be like, Dwayne, I think this. I'll be like, well, I don't think that way. She'll be like, Dwayne, but I think we really should do this. I'll be like, nah, honey, I don't think we should do it that way. And then we'll go back and forth on it. But then if my wife says, well, according to these verses here that you yourself preached, this is what thus saith the Lord says. That's when all of a sudden I'm like, 
Why'd you have to do that? And then all of a sudden, I'm like, you know what? You got me. And then next thing you know, if she shows me something, because there are times that I go through blind spots, and I'll forget what God has said. She brings to me what God has said. So wives, sometimes if you got a husband that's a big Bible thumper, and he's always Bible this and Ellen White that and everything else, hey, hit him back with it. Not for the, not, now, please understand, I'm, you know, we're not talking about tit for tat, you know, it's like, we're not doing it like that. But if you got a husband that respects inspiration, we talk about love languages all the time. That's one of his languages. Speak his language. Sometimes you have to say, honey, according to the word, such and such, and this is it. Now, there are some husbands that will say, who are you to teach me? Now, there are some husbands like that. Again, we got to go back to their trauma, probably see what's going on, and see if they can get some help. But the reality is, is that if an individual is in a sound state of mind, they should respect the authority of God's word coming through the mouth of his wife. Are you following that? I've had my son rebuke me. You know, it's like, seriously, there's times in, in, you know, just a moment or whatever it may be, and my son would say, Dad, but you said, and the Bible says such and such and such, and I'm like, man, he's right. And it's, it's a reminder, and it's just like, thank you. I appreciate that. You know what? You are correct. And I submit. And so by no stretch of the imagination, there are going to be times that the husband may give commands or make demands or whatever it may be, but God says, you make sure you remember, you ought to obey me rather than even men, including that man, your husband. God says, I always come first before everybody else. This is the description for the queen of the household. So this is how God kind of gives a summary of this house ban and this queen of the household role. Inspiration says, God made from the man a woman. For what? To be a companion and help meet for him. To be one with him. To cheer and encourage and bless him. I remember when I gave this assignment to this couple that I'm doing marriage counseling with, I asked them, I said, how do you see that you can cheer, bless, and encourage him? Tell me how you can do that. And both of them had assignments on how they would, they would have to explain how is it that you see you could do that? I said, tell me what you read in the council that you find to be easy. Tell me what you read in the council that you find to be difficult. And they began to say, man, this part of the council, I can do that because I grew up, da, da, da. But this part of the council, whew, this is too hard. And I said, okay, let's talk about why it's so hard. And we would start diving in on that and see how God could help us overcome. But again, we're looking at what God is saying now, especially to the queens. God is saying to that queen, I want you to be one with your husband. That's why I called you to be the queen of the house. I want you to be one with him. What are you going to do with him? You're going to cheer him up. You're going to encourage. You know, encourage is the opposite of discourage. Did you know that? I was just checking. I'm, I just want to make sure. Because what, what's the wife supposed to do? She's supposed to do what to her husband? To encourage him. Is that right? Not discourage him. Amen? Yeah, amen. I know it's quiet. But watch. It says cheer, encourage. And did you know that part of, a, part of the queen of the household's job, if you will, is how can I bless him today? Can you imagine that? That this is part of being that queen. You're thinking, how can I bless him? How can you use me as an instrument to bless my husband? Somebody says, Dwayne, move on to the men. All right, fine. <laughs> Listen, it says he, in his turn, is to be her helper. Is that what the quote says? No, he's to be her strong helper. Again, when our dearly beloved sisters go through those moments of weakness, when they go through any point of trauma, trial, inspiration says that husband is to be her strong helper. That's when he comes home after a hard day's work. He does not leave all his energy in the field. He understands I got to reserve energy so that when I come home, wherever my wife needs help, whether it be with the children, whether it be with washing dishes, whether it be whatever it may be, wherever she needs help from whatever was going on in her day in her life, he comes in not just as a weak complaining helper. Oh, man, I got to do this. I had a hard day at work. Give me the towel. You know, just, just angrily starts washing dishes. No, 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 no. He comes home. And he says, hey, babe, how can I help you? I got, I got plenty of energy in reserve. What you need me to do? 
And then he goes ahead, he becomes that strong helper to her. And whatever that case may be, continuing, it says all who enter into matrimonial relations with a what kind of purpose? Holy purpose. So the whole reason we got together is to figure out how can we better know God and demonstrate him one to another and, of course, impart this to our beloved children. That is the great purpose of our marriages. I would challenge every married couple in this room, ask yourself, how does my husband make me love Jesus more? How does my wife help me to love Jesus more? Ask yourself those questions. It's good questions to ask. And I'm sorry, I want to know. I want to be so exemplary for my wife and for the honor of God that I want to be everything that the Bible calls how a house band to be. So I want to know, honey, how, how can I better encourage you that you truly want to say, I want to follow God even more after being with you, Dwayne, and vice versa. Continuing, it says, the husband to obtain, oh, I love this assignment. Gentlemen, this is a beautiful assignment for us to enjoy. It says, the husband to obtain the pure affections of a woman's heart. And if you have to ask, well, what does that mean? Tonight, ask your wife. She has an answer. I can assure you, the wife can tell you how to obtain the pure affections of her heart. A woman typically, there's times where we're injured, like I said, trauma, but a woman typically does not have a problem letting her husband know the pure affections of my heart. This is how you obtain it, more and still more. But this is our job. The husband is to obtain the pure affections of a woman's heart. And then it goes on to say, the wife to soften one of the blessings of having our brides is some of us brothers, we come from rough backgrounds. And it says the wife to soften and improve her husband's character and give it completeness. When we do this, it says, it says we fulfill God's purpose for us. Adventist Home, page 99. All of that from Adventist Home, page 99. Beautiful, beautiful statement. It's worthy of meditation. It's worthy of deep contemplation. We're talking about God restoring the broken heart of the couples. God says the first thing that I'm doing is I'm presenting before them the great ideal, the ideal. Yeah. This is what I created husbands for. This is what I created wives for. And this is what wherever you're at, I'm calling you to rise up, come up a little higher. And ladies, I just want to put one more thing in there because... Years ago, a question was asked to my wife, who are you and what has God called you to do? My wife has hid behind the shadows of being Dwayne Lemon's wife for all these years. That's how she was known, Dwayne Lemon's wife. My children were known as Dwayne Lemon's children. Um, that causes problems in a lot of ways. It's like you don't have your own identity. So. I've been encouraging my wife for years. I say, honey, what is it that God has called you to do? Because you're my wife now, but what if I die? Then you're not my wife anymore. We know several people who child and children have died. So what if your child or children died? Who are you now? What's your purpose in life? Maybe it's more than just being a wife. Maybe it's more than just being mom. What else did God make you for? What else does God want you to do? Today, my wife is operating in what God created her for. Today, my wife is finding in herself what God made her for. The ministry that God gave her. Our children are all in their 20s now. They definitely still need our guidance. But they're not the little homeschool children anymore. So now, what I love is that my bride is, is entering into the ministry and the calling that God has placed on her life. And I said, girl, you have my 100% support. Because while God has called us to be queens of the household, ladies, called you to be queens of the household, I want you to remember and go back and read Proverbs 31, 10 through 31. I want you to read it. Because that woman was industrious. That woman had clear understanding of things that God has raised her up and called her to do. And in like manner, sisters, I want you to also see what is everything that God has called you to do? What has God placed on your heart? 
Is there something beyond being the wife and the mother that God may be calling you to do? And if so, I'd recommend you find out quickly what it is that God has called you to do, even beyond motherhood and being a beloved bride from your husband's side. What is it else that God wants you to do? Is there something else? If that's it, I'm not here to put that down. So be it. If that's it, so be it. Wife and mother, if that's it, so be it. But what if there's more? Even the Bible says in James 4, 2, you have not because you ask not. Sometimes you need to ask, Lord, why do I exist? It's in the precious little book, Education, page 267. And this is what got me on this road. In the book, Education, page 267, under the chapter, The Life Work, here is what the sentence says. Please listen carefully. It says, the specific place. The what kind of place? It says the specific place that God has appointed us in this life will be determined by our capabilities. It blows my mind that on March 22, 1972, when this black little spot and dot called Dwayne Lemon came into this world, God said, I have a specific place that I need him to occupy. And you put your birth date there. God says, when you came into this world, he says, I have a specific place for you. You know what I like asking people? Hey, how you doing? Greetings. After we get past all the greetings, I like to ask them, what's the specific place that God created you to fill? And you know what's sad? We got 50-year-olds in this room, 60-year-olds in this room, 70-year-olds in this room, possibly 80-year-olds in this room. And you know what? Some of us still don't know. We are at the point of life where the candle's going dim now. And we don't know the specific place. And that's why when I talk with my wife and when she pulls out her books and when she's studying and praying and looking and comparing and following all of the principles of how God speaks, and she can say, Dwayne, this is what God has called me to do. And she caught it at 49. I'm like, you go, girl. Seriously, you got my support. Because there's many people who have gone to their graves with no idea why specifically God created them. And for me, that's a tragedy. I think not a human being on this earth should, know, should not know why you were created the specific thing that God has called you to do. Every single one of us should have an answer to that question. But how rare and how few. The reality is, is that God says, this is what I wanted for husbands and wives at the very least. God says, this is what I wanted. This was the ideal. But the reality is, is we're not fitting the ideal. As I quoted last night, Inspiration says, there is not one marriage, not how many? There is not one marriage in 100 that results happily, that bears the sanction of God. Watch that. There's not one in 100 marriages that not only bears happily, but that God can say, yep, I did that. A lot of people get married because that's what they want. And like I told you, our hearts are so hard, our hearts are so stubborn, we'll, we'll twist every Bible verse and spirit of prophecy quote to justify why we want to marry some woman or some man. That's how wicked our hearts are. But God says, not one in 100 marriages results happily that bears the sanction of God and places the parties in a position better to glorify him. The evil consequences of poor marriages are numberless. You can't number it. They are contracted from impulse. Please, please, please slow down. Some of y'all need to hear this. Slow down. You need to find a friend in Jesus. You need to realize he's so real that he can actually satisfy you in every way in your singleness until the time comes that he can give sanction. I approve this marriage. For those of us who are married, if 
you're not experiencing the ideal, God has some principles of how he can help the broken heart with the couples. And this is where we close. I am going to show you some ways to strengthen our marriage. Now, obviously, this is something, you know, you spent a whole week just on these things. And imagine I'm doing this in one night. You understand? So what I'm going to give you is I'm going to give you things that you can reference. I'm going to put some things up on the screen. I want you to take pictures. Uh, you, you can write them down, but I need you to write fast. Um, but I want you to look at this and, and just take it to heart. These are principles that can help restore marriages. This is coming from experience in my own 25 years. This is coming from the experience of others who have gone through many trials and, and many counselors, people who have 50 years, 60 year and 70 years successful marriages. Okay. So what I'm about to put on the screen is for you. And by God's grace, if you see my husband, you know, or we as husbands, we're not functioning as the head, the lawmaker and the priest, the wise, maybe I'm not functioning as that queen. What can God do about it? There's several things you could do about it. What does the Lord say? Number one. The first thing we're going to consider is talk. Talk, family. Try to understand each other and listen with patience and without judgment. Try, beloved. I know that this is hard. We got to pray sometimes through this thing, but we got to talk. And when we talk, we got to try to be patient. Don't do stuff like, come on, come on, hurry up. You, you, just, kill, you just killed the whole communi communion. You can't, you got to be patient. Even if you feel like this person's making no sense right now, they're making excuses again or whatever, just let them talk. And just say, Lord, hold me right now. Help my tongue, help my heart to just be calm and to just go with this. Be patient. And then remember, listen without judgment. Try not to judge. Try not to judge. Some husbands in this room have gone through unresolved trauma and they're trapped by it until Christ makes them free. Some women have gone to this room, have gone through unresolved trauma and they're trapped by it until Christ makes them free. So there are some of us who, you know, we're not at that place yet where we're free enough that we can actually hear where each other are coming from. Most importantly, hear what God is trying to say to us. So number one, talk. Try to understand each other and listen with patience and without judgment. Isaiah 118, come now, let's reason together. Can you imagine God listening to Israel? Does God already know the answers? Does God already know what they're going to say? And can you imagine God? I like Ezekiel 18 where, where God says, so you say my ways are unjust and you say your ways are just. God could have shut that argument down. God could have been like, listen, I'm not even going to argue with you on this. I'm God. You're the creation. So let's just end it right here. But what does God do? God says, OK, tell me. Tell me how my ways are unjust. And tell me why your ways are just. And then God just patiently listens. He already knows I'm right and you're wrong. But he, he's, let, he's letting you go through all the motions. He's just, go ahead. And then he reasons. In John chapter 10, when Jesus says, I and my father are one. And then here it is that they're like, what? And they're ready to go ahead and stone him. And then Jesus looks back. Now, Jesus could say, Jesus is like, you know, with the blink of an eye, I can turn you all into dust. But what does Jesus do? Jesus sees them coming to him in aggression. And Jesus says, many things I've said to you. Which one of these are the reasons that you stone me? He already knows I'm innocent. I'm fine. I didn't do nothing wrong. But he's just patiently. What, many things. Are, why, why do you want to stone me? They said, we don't stone you because anything you did. They said, we stone you because you being a man, make yourself God. Jesus could have said, excuse me, I am God. He could have done that, right? But no, he didn't do that. Jesus says, uh, doesn't it say in Psalm 82 and verse 6 that you are God's? He just starts reasoning with them. This is how I read scripture now. I'm, I'm looking at the character of God behind the verse. He's patient and he's calm when he could be like, look, I don't even have to answer you. But instead of copping all that attitude, he just meets them where they are, even in their weakness, and says, all right, all right, wifey, keep talking. And he just keeps going. So again, talk. Do it without judgment. Try to be patient. Let's go to the next one. Number two, choose to pray and possibly fast together for God to show you both what he would have you to do. Choose to pray and, if necessary, even fast. Do it together. 
honey, let, let, let's go into a season of prayer and fasting. We're, we're going through a pretty serious struggle right now. Let, let's have a season of prayer and fasting on this issue. Let's open up the word of God. Let's, let's see how God can guide us. You know, there's a lot of husbands and wives that don't do this. They don't do this. There's all this assumption. You know the word of God already. Well, evidently not, because we're not operating by it. But it's like, take some time. Pray. Honey, let's pray together. Let's fast. Let's, let's, see, let's see what God can show us about what he would have us to do. That's what they did in the days of Ezra. Then the Bible says they afflicted their souls and they fasted before God so that God can show them the right way for them, themselves, their children, for everybody. Galatians 6 and verse 2, you know, bear each other's burdens. Pray together. Also, number three. Ah, big one. Choose to forgive. There's a threefold rationale to this. Number one, how, what, what helps us forgive thoroughly offensive spouses? You know, they did something wrong, right? What enables us to, to, thoroughly, to forgive thoroughly offensive spouses, husband or the wife? Number one, remember, they don't know what they're doing. Luke 23, 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't, they don't know what they're doing. Many a times, our husbands and wives, we don't really know what we're doing. We, we, we think we know what we're doing, but we don't know, right? Number two, they may be subject to momentary demonic control. Now question, if a demon is trying to control your wife, what do you do? You fight to get that demon off your wife. You follow that? You get that point? You understand that? It's like if that wife is to be protected as that weaker vessel, then that means that once a demon puts their hands on our beloved, that's an occasion for all out war coming from us. Ladies, if you see a demon that's on your husband, that is your time to intercess and to pray and to do all that you can that Christ will deliver your man from that demonic influence. The Bible says in Matthew 16, 21 through 23, that's the story of Peter. When Jesus said, whom do men say I, the son of man, am? Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus says, my father, which is in heaven through the Holy Spirit, has made this known unto you. Peter was led by the spirit of God. Moments later, Christ says, I'm going to die and the third day I'm going to rise again. And the next thing you know, Peter starts rebuking him. And the Bible says, Jesus said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. That's called momentary demonic control. When you read, when you read Ministry of Healing, page 172, talking about those who are um, intemperate, in the chapter Helping the Intemperate, she says that we must remember that when we are helping those who are intemperate, we are not dealing with sane men. Continuing the quote, it says, we must remember that we are dealing with people that for the time are under the power of a demon. For the time, we call that momentary demonic control. So there are times where spouse can be under momentary demonic control. Under that moment, you dropped your guard and Satan got in and took advantage of you got to remember that when you when you because these are things that holds us from forgiving we say i know i remember what you did last year i remember what you did last week i remember what you did yesterday and we and we get so caught up into that hurt that we forget that maybe our husband or our wives became subject to a demon maybe they think they're right but they need further education to really see that they were wrong they really don't know what they're doing finally what's the third reason to forgive it says remember what god did with you as a worse offender. Whenever we compare what people have done to us and what we did to God, we always come out worse than our offenders. That's why Ephesians 4.32 says, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You understand that? That'll help you forgive. Seriously, it'll really help us forgive. Okay, let's bring it down. Invest in each other's interests, though they may not initially be yours. Invest in each other's interests. Let me give you the Bible verse for that, Colossians 3. Invest in each other's interests, even though they're not initially yours. Granted, sometimes, you know, your husband and wife, you know, I don't know. You know, when we, when we were courting, everybody showed interest in everything. It didn't matter if, if you like looking at rocks, just if you like looking at ants crawl over rocks, 
because you liked him or liked her so much, you said, you know, I, I like watching ants crawl over rocks too. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's just whatever you like, they like because everybody got interest. All of a sudden, we lock them in, and then all of a sudden, you're like, hey, dear, let's go, let's go watch ants walking over. I ain't got no time for that. And all of a sudden, I don't have no time for that. It's like, hold on, but you were watching ants walk over rocks with me. It's like, yeah, but <laughs> it's a different day. Yeah, exactly. You understand? But, what, but God says, listen, keep investing in each other's interests. Even, even when it may not initially be yours. I say initially because you'd be amazed at how God can just turn our hearts around. And your husband's interest can become your interest. Your wife's interest can become your interest. But when we invest in each other's interest, it's amazing how walls come down. It's amazing how walls come down. And spouses start, wives start, man, wives journal. My husband joined me today in sewing. And I know he was having a hard time sticking himself with those needles. But he did it just because he wanted to spend time with me. Man, that'll, 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 make, a melt, that'll make a melt in your arms. You invest in each other, OK? Almost done? Oh, we'll go there in just a second. Two more and we're done. Make practical covenants. I really like this one. It's very practical. Again, if that, if that home is broken right now, God wants to repair the broken heart, look at what he says. It says, make practical covenants. We will not argue in public or in front of children. That's a practical covenant. Make, make some agreements. You know, we're not going to argue in public. We're not going to argue in front of the children. Uh, for the time, we will not discuss triggering subjects. That's a practical agreement. Like, you know what? Every time we talk about this, I notice we keep getting into these fights. Let, let's make a covenant that for a little while we're going to give ourselves a break. While God is working on us and reshaping our hearts, let's just go ahead and say on these triggering subjects, we're going to leave this alone for a little while. Can we agree on that? You start making practical covenants. Um, it goes on. Make schedules that you can try to plan around to always meet each other's needs emotionally, physically, and spiritually. A lot of fighting happens in couples and marriages because needs are not being met. And a lot of times needs are not being met because nobody's making the right priorities. And so this is something you can do now. Make a covenant. Just say, look, I'm going to make a covenant. We're going to make a schedule. We're going to do something that allows me to meet those needs better than I've been doing it. These are things that people do. These are things that we have done, and it has worked. Finally, two more. Seek godly counseling. Seek godly counseling. Proverbs eleven fourteen. Seek godly counseling. If you know that right now my marriage is broken, it's not where it's supposed to be. We are not experiencing the ideal of the house band of the queen of the household. God says, all right, well, maybe you need some godly counseling. Seek out godly counseling. Be very prayerful about who you counsel with. And above all things, make sure your counselor is subject to the counselors. Thy testimonies are my delight and my counselors. This is the testimonies right here. Psalm 119, verse 24. So God says, let the testimonies be your counselor. So whatever counselor you find, make sure that their counseling is based on the counselor. That's your safety. And though this is hard, but yes, this is sometimes needed as well because some homes and some couples have become so thoroughly toxic to each other. If necessary, separate with the purpose of seeking how the Lord can bring you back together to reconcile. Sometimes it can get so bad that there might be a need to separate. But you're not separating to say, whew, got that annoying guy out of my life. Whew, man, got that annoying sister out of my life. All right, break. No. What you're focusing on is this is my time to do some deep heart searching, some deep intercessing, and praying for that demon that loves to steal, kill, and destroy to get out of my house and out of my marriage. And so there are times where you have to seek even separation. But remember, we separate for a purpose. And the ultimate purpose is that we might be reconciled. Amen? I believe with all of my heart that if we put these things into practice, J James says, the blessing is in the doing. If we put these things into practice, it'll help us in receiving that blessing from God 
to repair the broken heart in the context of the married couples. Remember 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 7. That's our last verse. Let's turn there. I understand to a degree, certainly not in detail, but I understand that many of our homes can be challenged. Again, not one in 100 marriages results happily. So that means that already under this roof, we know there's some unhappy marriages, unfulfilling marriages. God is not asking you to tolerate your spouses. He wants you to love them. And sometimes we get to a place that we begin to feel like things have gotten so bad. God might be able to do well for others, but I don't know if he could do well for me. Well, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, right there in verse 7, talking about that agape love, it says it bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. And it endures all things. Love never fails. Please do not give up on your marriages. Don't even mentally check out. A lot of us have mentally checked out even though our bodies remain. You got to mentally check back in. You got to mentally say, all right, Lord, let's do it again. This time, by your grace, I'm going to focus more on me than on my spouse. I'm going to just see how you can work in my heart. And you can perform the miracles that you always do best. But I want to encourage you, whether you're listening online or any of us in this room, please do not give up on your marriages. Don't even mentally check out. Satan always begins in the mind. Remember, the imaginations of the antediluvians were evil continually. It was from the imagination that image worship became a reality. So be careful what you even allow in your head. Do not give up on your husband. Do not give up on your wife. May God give us a renewed zeal to say that with him, all things are possible. For those of us who are single, and maybe you don't want to get married because you see nothing but broken marriages. Hey, you know what? In this movement, we have something called pioneers. And pioneers are people who get things started. If you don't have any happy marriages in your church or in your vicinity or whatever it may be, be a pioneer. You be the first one. But don't, don't, don't give up on the wonderful ordinance of marriage. Don't give up on it just because you have poor examples all around you. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. And through him, we can do all things, even see repair to the broken heart, the broken home, even with couples. Question, how many of us understood our study tonight? You understand it? Is it our desire to say, Lord, whether I be single or whether I be married, by your grace I will be content and I will rise up to the ideal that you have set before me? If that's the covenant that you're wishing to make, then please stand to your feet with me. I'm going to pray with you, pray for you, and I trust that God is going to bless us well beyond our expectations. Let us all pray together, beloved. Our loving Father, we thank you so much for what you have taught us tonight. We thank you for helping us to see the power of your word. Lord, we're grateful that you set before us both ideals, but you also know how to meet us in our realities and help bring us up to it. Lord, I pray for every married couple under the sound of my voice that you will please pour out your spirit upon each of us. Lord, we know that we may not be living up to the ideal right now, but Tonight's a brand new night and tomorrow's a brand new day. And as long as you give us breath, we pray that you will help us to rise up to the occasion, to believe, to hope, and to endure as a result of your love within our hearts. And that we will be husbands after your order. And we will be wives after your order. And that we will experience all of the blessings that heaven offers through the blessed union and covenant of marriage. Keep us, I pray, O oh God, and repair our broken hearts and our broken homes. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.